lonesome night. And Babbitt's ballin' wind bind a bone. Haggard Hanks harks haphazardly, hoping humanity heeds his hyperbole. Question one. Oh, it's gonna be one of those kind of movies that just hops all over the place, bebopping and scatting all over me. Distracted driving. What the f am I doing here? Don't ask me, Halle Berry. Ten seconds ago, I was on a beach following a man with a top hat affliction. And seconds before that, I was sat around a campfire living out the alternate ending to Castaway. I haven't been this lost since that time my parents dropped me off at Ikea with nothing more than a rusty compass and an encouraging Jeremy B. Free! While my extensive experience as an editor has led me to a disdain for flashbacks and flash-forwards and all such tricksy gimmicks... Typewriteration! Also, I'm sorry, movie, but no amount of self-awareness and self-deprecation will save you from being sin for what is one of the most confusing ass opening sequences I have ever seen, and I just watched Primer. I believe that if you, dear reader, can extend your patience for just a moment, you will find there is a method to this tale of madness. The following three-hour feature film would beg to differ. The movie's biggest weakness is its source material. When reading a massive novel, it's much easier to keep track of many characters in different settings and time periods, but a movie version has to cut a lot of that down, and it's going to bounce around between stories and settings and time periods so much, we end up just hearing blah, blah, blah whenever they say anything important. Do you know the price a quarter pound of these will earn? Five cents. Your version of the truth is all that matters. Thing I tell myself every morning as a mantra, but also to help me forget about that indecency charge, ends up in the script. Wouldn't it have been easier to introduce these six disparate stories without f with the timeline as well? This sh is complicated enough to follow without also having five of these introductions take place at their respective conclusions. Tenet called! It wants its migraine back! Frobisher? Mr. Robert, if this is Frobisher's room, wouldn't it make more sense for Six Smith to be the one escaping through the window? In fact, Frobisher is leaving the country altogether. Why does he care what the hotel staff thinks anyway? He could leave through the f***ing front door. What are they gonna do? Kick him out? P.S. Thanks for the waistcoat. I needed something of yours to keep me company. Ah yes, nothing says I love you like a waistcoat. There are three lamps on in this shot, and yet the entire scene is darker than the lyrics to my middle school goth band's one-hit song, My Urethra. This movie jumps around in time more than a Bill and Ted movie. Murder foreshadowing. For murdering? Murder shadowing? The rest of this particular storyline straight up only happens because of this accidental meeting, and it is insane to me. The broken elevator conveniently gives Six Smith and Ray time to explore her journalistic background, which will in turn inspire him to ask her for help in exposing Hook's unsafe nuclear reactor. It also allows Six Smith to exposit the location of his niece, a piece of information Ray will later use as a last ditch effort to expose Hook's evil plan. None of this happens if Ray, oh, I don't know, takes the stairs or waits for the next elevator. Thank the Lord for plot inducing elevator malfunctions it was the night of the lemon prizes not the lemon prizes oh my god let's go this vulgar irish john travolta thing that hanks is doing here just does not work at all i won't be needing this anymore I know the Daily Mirror is hardly a bastion of tasteful journalism, but I struggle to believe that even they would be allowed to publish this graphic picture of a bloody dead man on the fucking page of their newspaper. Also, did the bartender, having just witnessed Hoggins murder a man, decide the next appropriate course of action was to serve him a drink, and then immediately start taking photos of him? What's the f- T.M.O.T. Cavendish. I presume. Caught with your cacks down. Is that really surprising? You just broke into the man's bathroom. This is a perfectly acceptable place to have one's cacks down. <laughs> What the law do for Felix f Finch? The law put Finch's murderer in prison. Now, admittedly, that's perhaps little comfort for a dead man. But these guys are acting as if they can kill with impunity. Ordinarily, I begin by asking prisoners to recall their earliest memories. Why? To waste as much time as possible? May I say you speak consumer surprisingly well. This movie really needs to work on its definition of surprising. If the sole purpose of the fabricants is to satisfy consumers, wouldn't it be a relatively simple yet crucial feature for fabricants to fluently speak the consumer's native tongue? What else would they be speaking? Yeah, she speaks Mandarin here, but if it's restricted, why make that her default? Papa son servers have just one possible future. You mean exaltation? Could you describe this annual rite of passage? This guy is answering his own questions, like some kind of a screenwriting exposition monster. Who woke her? Siri. Why would a seer wake a server? Why does Radio Shack ask for your phone number when you buy batteries? Do you ever think about what it must be like up there with the consumers? Up there, and there's so much room where babies burp and flowers bloom. 
I'm going to go ahead and say that the restaurant forcing these girls to wear these uniforms is ultimately as responsible for this kind of behavior as the person performing said behavior. This is gruesome. This is the far future. Can't you put something in her brain that kills her without all this blood and gore in front of kids and families? Jesus. Also, that guy with the pen trigger was Hugh Grant in super heavy Asian makeup, and I have questions, concerns, and more questions. The movie wants to tie its stories together theme-wise by casting the same actors over and over in heavy prosthetics or makeup, but all it does is pull me out of each storyline when I see blonde, maybe white Halle Berry, and female nurse Hugo Weaving, or Asian Hugh Grant. God damn it! The director said, let's have Tom Hanks eat an apple while narrating this scene so that everyone knows he's the good guy. Wait, that's not right. Ain't no blade can protect you from the true true. The true true. Native now. I guess Hugh's playing the cultural appropriator in this movie. Tom Hanks watches his brother and nephew get slaughtered to save himself. <laughs> and I'm sending the movie for trying to make me think that was wrong. He'd have died too, you dicks. Prescience come bothering twice a year. Their ships creep crawling on waves, just floating on the smart of the oldens. What would a civilization with technology this advanced, be it inherited or not, possibly need from a primitive group of valley dwellers and goat herders? Yes, I know Marinim is here on her own mission, but how did this bartering process start? Does the tribe have a particularly good goat stew recipe? Painted novelty footballs? What? Why words slink and slide off a tongue when we need them most? Why movie talk missing words act like new language genius? Discount Susan Sarah! Ah! Because now it is probable that the enforcers and the DNA sniffers will find out about you. And if they do, if they realize your connection to Una 939, you will be excised. How exactly are the enforcers going to figure out any link between Yuna and Sonmi? There's barely a link to begin with. All they did was watch a clip of a movie together in a cupboard, and Yuna was killed before she could even give that information up. Also, what use would a DNA sniffer be? These fabricants all live, work, shower, and sleep together. They'd be covered in each other's DNA. But you have a choice. You can remain here and risk being discovered. Let me guess. Or she can climb out the window and up the scaffolding to the roof? Yeah, seen this movie before. Here is a woman trying to sleep with a nightstand lamp turned on and a mysterious skylight that funnels the moon and starlight directly over her head. If you no help, you kill I just the same is true. You know it. False equivalency, but he's got a point, too. So, old Six Smith has written a report about a nuclear reactor that is classified, and he's about to die for it, and all I can think about is what I'm gonna have for lunch. She sends the hotel employee to go call the police, and I have questions. First, why can't the hotel employee use the phone in the room? If you're worried about fingerprints, she probably has gloves, no? Second, sending a hotel employee away and staying alone with the body only serves to make Ray more of a suspect in the murder. Third, is this the ugliest color palette for a hotel room you've ever seen, or what? Mauve wallpaper, burnt orange ceramic sink, olive green chairs, it's like the 70s meets pea soup. Tampering with the scene of a murder. You are a runaway slave, and I am a lawyer. How do you imagine we could possibly be friends? Exactly. Fantastic point. Well made. Who in their right mind would want to be friends with a lawyer? <sighs> Jesus. Javier Gomez, what did I tell you about jumping onto my balcony? Why do you leave the door open if you don't want me to come in? Javier would be great at cinema sins. P.S. Best news of all. I've started my own work. Only just now? This is the Cloud Atlas Sextet. Roll sex tenets. <laughs> Sir, madam, I assure you this is completely innocent. Completely innocent, I promise. I saw an old guy from the future looking in through the window. My only logical option was to protect your daughter with my bare body like a human shield. The erection? Oh, yes, well, that's slightly harder to explain. And by hard, I mean flaccid. I mean placid. I mean, how? Oh, wow, have you seen the moon? Sure, it's a nice night. Yeah, yes, sir, no doubt. And, uh, the weather sure is unseasonably warm tonight. Also, why did this cat ever seem like a valid penis protector? I can count at least eight other options that don't involve animal cruelty, are less wiggly, and are also not likely to. <laughs> what were the chances that she still lived in this house? Stalking. Also, that wallpaper, my god. Tom Hanks is always running, cliche. Wait, that's not right. Tom and Hallie speak future ease, and I'm just gonna skip. Just sign right here. This retirement psychiatric facility says this and this only, and he signs and then he's committed and can't leave. And that is some bull. That is not how it works when you commit someone you love that is beyond their wits. And this guy isn't even beyond his wits. I understand wanting to conceal using the prescience technology to cure Katkin, the prime directive, non-interference, etc. The unfortunate side effect is that this witch doctor medicine man is going to think he is a f***ing genius for curing her, and will probably be worshipped as such. And that, my friend, is how you get ants. I mean, religion. Your food is in here. It's not what you are used to, but I think you will like it. 
Considering Son Mi is used to eating soap, I don't think that claim is as surprising or impressive as you might think. This Roman numeral means 2012. Now we find out later that the ghastly ordeal of Timothy Cavendish is based on a book written by Cavendish, which covers events that happened in 2012. This means that he had to write the book, get it published, and then get said book turned into a film and released in the same year. Okay, not impossible, but the man is hardly Stephen King. I am Miss Milks. You do not wish to cross me. Discount Nurse Ratchet. Stowaway. This is stowaway, even if he sh silver nuggets. Really? That can't possibly be true. Anyone that sh silver nuggets would literally be everyone's best friend until they died, even if they'd previously killed a couple popes. He told me their goal was the creation of a free world fabric, and you and I had failed. I was their last hope. For the billionth, trillionth time in cinema history, we are watching the story of the one, humanity's only hope for whatever it may be. In this version, however, I have no idea why Sun Me is their last hope. Papa Song didn't seem to have a shortage of fabricants. Why can't the Alliance keep trying with those? Also, other than being curious, I can't see anything at all that has distinguished Sun Me from her other fabricant friends. In fact, she is yet to show an ounce of free will. Between being coerced by Yuna into watching a forbidden movie and being convinced to flee the holodeck hotel by Haiju, she's turning out to be a pretty fantastic example of how not to do free will. I have to say, if all lady journalists look like you, I might start to take this uh, women's lib thing more seriously. Lloyd Hook survives this. Okay, uh, you wait here, and I will go and find someone smarter who can... Uh... Walk you through the details. Now I know a mustache twiddling bad guy here just showed he had zero respect for women, but would he really be dumb naive enough to leave an investigative journalist, even one with a wound, unattended for any amount of time? Especially mere feet from the office of the man he just had murdered. Also, I call bullshit that Ray was able to see diddly sh from where she was standing all the way over here. Can't erase a movie from your filmography and still expect to keep the superpowers, Catwoman. And the waitresses. They all had the same face. Sound more like Pearl Jam lyrics than anything I need to know about this movie, honestly. <laughs> Looks like the Prometheus School of Running Away From Things got new jerseys and new gym equipment this year. Sweet! She's being asked to go outside a tall building on trust. This is the Matrix. <laughs> this works. Either Haiju has bullet repulsing skin, or this ship is being piloted by a stormtrooper. Haiju, we later learn, survives this. Mr. Bohar! It appears we have an addition to our crew. What? Are you telling me that was an actual audition? And why was he going to have Atua killed mid attempt? If Ewing hadn't taken action, Atua would be dead. Great work, Captain Cowell! <laughs> As I am. That's a compliment, but it's still super racist. Hey boss, how are we gonna get the red sunset we want for the scene on the balcony? Green screen, baby. That's why they pay you the big bucks, sir. Who are you? Uh, just a grip, the key grip. No, sir, just a regular grip. You're fired. Freedom. The fatuous jingle of our civilization. But only those deprived of it have the barest inkling of what it really is. The opening line of Amazon's employee handbook somehow makes it into the script of this movie. There's a natural order to this world, Fabricant. And the truth is, this order must be protected. The dialogue here is already ripped from the Matrix, but having Hugo Weaving deliver it just hammers home how much this movie lifts from the Wachowski's previous works. There's no good choice here, is there? The choice Dr. Goose is about to lay out is between losing his job or the possible millions of deaths caused by a nuclear meltdown. Jesus, this guy must really love his job. You have to do whatever you can't not do. Okay, but if Dr. Goose can't not do the thing he's not supposed to not do, how many pecks of pickled peppers can he be expected to pick or not pick for Mother Goose and Dr. Sips? Olden's got the smart. They mastered sick and seeds, make miracles, fly across the sky. While we're on the topic of flying across the sky, why the hell does Marinim need the help of Forest Dwelling Gump at all? Perhaps they don't have the flying ships left behind by the Olden's, but surely the Prescients have some better way of finding Mana Soul and the ability to drop Marinim off directly. How does one shut off all the streetlights on a bridge in the 70s? Yes, this is the bridge to the chemical plant, but that doesn't mean the city gave the plant full control of the streetlights on the bridge. I can understand that Ray might have lost sight of the car chasing her as it moved through her blind spot and alongside her, but the damn thing still has a f***ing engine. She must have heard that shit getting closer. Oh man, this is exciting. I hope the guy in black wins. 
No, I mean that one. No, not that one. That one. No, no, the other guy. Oh, wait. No, you're right. That one. Running. Courtyard. Packing. Suspense. <laughs> Old ladies are not just really good pickpockets by nature, you know. Abstraction is one thing, but movies always make pickpocketing look easier than it is. Believe me, I've tried. Hmm. Perhaps I've said too much. Why did I take it exactly? Can't say. An intuition. A sense of significance. That from this point on, there was no going back. I mean, you could always, now stick with me here because this is a bit wild, put the gun back. You know, I don't need this. I don't need this entire storyline, but I definitely don't need these two religious questing idiots rock climbing with manufactured tension like a little stumble and some rope burn. Christ! When did the Wachowskis forget how to shoot action? <laughs> Tron, the legacy of the Cloud Atlas Uprising. God, now we have a hovercraft. He's probably taking her to see the Oracle right now. Excessive force confirmed. Excessive is an odd descriptor for a set of kill orders. Who defines what is excessive? Moreover, why is excessive ever the goal? Excessive just guarantees you've used more force than you need it. The Pacific Journal of Adam Ewing, eh? That's one of the other stories in this movie. And here it's literally propping up the leg of this story's piano, and that is pretty emblematic for how this movie takes what could have been subtle connections between stories and crams them down your throat with a heavy hand. They're trapped in the damway. We've got them. So by trapped, you meant trapped unless they escape through any of these easily accessible escape hatches, right? Nay, the dead never stay dead. Especially if you're Hugo Reaping over here, who was more than happy to blow up an entire f***ing plane to make sure he killed Dr. Goose, but couldn't stick around and make sure Ray was 100% dead because... plot? And before she died, she spoke of her acts and deeds. I wish this far future way of speaking was a priceless Ming Voss, and I wish that Voss was displayed near my home so I could go and visit it and steal it from the museum and deliberately smash it to bits in front of a group of school children at whom I would then repeatedly shout in an Al Pacino impression, Hooah! You f***ing kids! Hooah! And then I would get arrested, and ultimately the judge would have to decide how long to send me to jail. But at my sentencing hearing, I leave the defense table and I run at the judge screaming, Hooah! Hooah! Before being contained by the bailiff and given more jail time due to a contempt of court charge. Then I get thrown in solitary because this guy at Chow tried to take the last chicken patty before I got any, and I lean down close to his plate and yell, Hooah! at the chicken patty itself. But solitary was a breeze. Easiest time I ever did, because I was no longer listening to this insipid and annoying pigeon English bullshit. You are lusting for that darkly sweet meat. The f***? Suddenly old Georgie is horny? Guess he wants to stop Halle Berry's character, but earlier he was suggesting killing her, and now he's suggesting screwing her. Old Georgie needs to pick a lane. Also, old Georgie is, I suppose, the raw and feral side of Charlie. Is his name Charlie? Oh, who cares? But that suggests that Charlie's own mind was wanting to sex this lady instead of help her. Well, that doesn't compute. Is old Georgie real? Is he a ghost? The lucky charmed mother after a hundred years without cereal? Kill her now, before it's too late! Wait, now we're back to advising a killer? Jesus, now Keith David is Asian. And yes, I know the filmmakers explained all this away by saying the actors were portraying the same souls across boundaries of time and race. But I think we all know that excuse is some faux intellectual bullshit on fire. Why would big oil... Hire Lloyd Hooks to run a nuclear reactor. Hooks doesn't want the report discovered because he doesn't want the reactor fixed. He wants it to fail. Let's talk about the bad guy's plan. Somehow most, if not all, of the major oil companies have joined together in a grand conspiracy to kill millions of people with a nuclear meltdown to prove that nuclear power is too dangerous, thereby securing their own future profits for decades to come. Actually, well, makes a lot of sense. Can we make sure this isn't something that's actually in the works? Please? The metal artichoke turns into a satellite dish and squirts off a bit of blue space sperm headed for God knows where, and I don't know about you, but I'm turned on. Somehow, the sunsets on the boat are more realistic than the ones on a balcony from earlier. Come on, Louisa. First rule of mystery writing. A good clue always leads to another clue. That's mystery writing, though, kid. Not real life. You think you're in a screen movie or something? Under the sunset! Honestly, people of the world, who the f keeps their spare keys trapped between the visor and the roof of your car. Who f does that? All for one and one for all? I feel like this is what we would get if the creators of Wallace and Gromit made a Fast and Furious movie, and I'm kind of here for it. However, any comparison to the Fast and Furious franchise earns you an automatic sin. There is no need for Ray to turn around and continue to stand right in the middle of the f***ing road. There's a very high likelihood that the outcome of this stunt is Napier completely missing Supreme Leader Smoke Speeder, which means he will plow straight into Ray, thus killing her as originally intended. Then who's going to lead the new wave of Jedi? No wonder this film is so divisive. Wait, am I in the wrong movie? Where'd he go? I don't know. 
Why are you asking him? How the f*** did you not see where he went? Was there something more interesting than the escape of the man who's been paid to kill you happening across the road? Gah. How did neither of you see his ass running down the road, open this poor bastard's car door, and then shoot him? Napier was looking in that exact direction. Also, convenient road sweeper is f***ing convenient. Why did the Shawshank crew park their escape car in full view of the mother road? Park it back behind the pub, ditch it in the field, anywhere but here, goddammit. Also, did they just stop at the first pub they found and grab a pint and declare victory? No immigrants here, no immigrants oh. here. Okay, if your opening line is no immigrants here, I am definitely assuming there are immigrants here. He just killed a dog. The evil doctor on this boat starts expositing his entire evil plan to his victim, which, of course, is his undoing. Tom Hanks is always getting his evil plans undone by over-expositing right at the end. Wait, that's not right. How can a trained assassin have such atrocious aim? How does he stay in work? I mean, surely it's harder to hit the handrail. Ducky factory. That was convenient, but not entirely unexpected. Bloodlust. Why, you ask? It's absolutely simple. There is gold in your trunk. I want it. So I have killed you for it. Hey, do you want to know what isn't absurdly simple? This f***ing plan! Dr. Goose has been gradually poisoning Ewing for what seems like weeks under the guise of curing him so that he can steal all of his money. Can't imagine this poison comes cheap. There's gotta be easier and cheaper ways of killing Ewing. Especially at sea. This whole place is filled with things trying to kill you every day. No one will be seated during the one-on-one -on -one below deck wrestling match during a storm that is shot and edited by the Tasmanian Devil. What exactly are you gonna do, Zachary? Run over there and hide? I think they'll have that covered. The movie makes it seem like Tom Hanks just ran from the top of the mountain back to his home village in just a few minutes, even though the reverse journey took days. Luke Skywalker, eat your heart out. How many sawed-off throats does one need to see in a movie? I vote none. Recycled fabricants are a cheap source of protein. Sup. They feed us to ourselves. In order to maintain their army of clones, some clones are killed so that they can be turned into food to feed other clones, which are then turned into food to... You get the picture. It seems wildly unsustainable. And if the workforce is so valuable, how can they afford to kill bits of it off for food? Bringing your feet to a horse chase. Thankfully, for the sake of justice, Six Smith also mailed a copy of the report to his daughter, granddaughter, whoever the f***. Which, if you think about it, makes all the bull*** that Halle Berry endured the last hour of this movie all for naught, no? She got pushed off a bridge into the river and nearly drowned. Our lives are not our own. From womb to tomb, we are bound to others. Womb to Tomb was also the name of a student film I made back in college. It starred a young Dave Batista and was set in a maternity ward during a zombie apocalypse. Entered into a few festivals, won a few awards, nearly got me arrested. We don't speak of it anymore. Like Solzhenitsyn laboring in Vermont, I shall beaver away in exile. Unlike Solzhenitsyn, I shan't be alone. I'm all for a happy ending, but my god. Cavendish must be the luckiest man alive. Apparently sometime soon after he escapes from the care home, he knocks on Ursula's door, who just so happens to be living in the same f***ing house she did 40 years ago, and is invited in for tea and crumpets to be told, yes, she has a family, but is fortunately divorced or widowed. He then falls back in love and moves in with him while he writes a book that gets published and turned into a feature film in the same f***ing year. How is the story set in the present day the least believable story of the movie? Man, the future really does f***ing love it some concrete. Fly where you die. Uh, just as well. My yawning is done. These kids just listen to a story of slavery, oppression, boning, murder, corruption, more boning, more slavery, the brutal slaughter of the storyteller's own tribe and family, more boning, and they want more? Even if we assume that Zachary only shared the bits that he witnessed, which doesn't seem to be what the movie is telling us, these kids are f***ed up for wanting more. This movie is two hours and 51 minutes long! Hey you! Yeah, you! Do you want to play sports for the Prometheus School of Running Away From Things, but aren't sure you've got the talent needed to make the squad? Introducing the Prometheus Intramural Leagues! Tryouts are being held soon for a variety of ball-related sports, so grab your shirt and meet us in the gym! This new shirt is on sale now! Just click the merch link below or head to the shop at cinemasins.com.